Hello and welcome to Open Mind UFO Radio. I am your host Alejandro Rojas and you may notice the sounds a little different. It is because I am out and about and in fact you didn't hear a new show on KGRA for that reason and my interview uh, with MJ Benias, which is what this was going to be this week, I, I didn't bring with me so I wasn't able to prepare that so you'll have to wait for that great discussion we had for next time however i do have something special to share with you all but before i do that let me also inform you that i am still lucky enough to have mr martin willis from podcast ufo joining me to talk some ufo news well it is my honor sir no oh, it's it's wonderful to have you and what's funny is I'm doing uh, an interview with MJ, and, and I guess I'll air that next week, but you're going to be airing one as well this week. That's correct. So uh, this show, who my guest is going to be, is something that Martin's also stolen from me. Just kidding. We'll <laughs> talk about that too. But uh, So this is really cool. Uh, if you read my review of Unidentified, the History Channel series, then uh, you'll see I got a quote from the executive producer and investigative journalist Anthony Lapp. So I actually did an interview with him and I decided, hey, you know, I've got this great audio interview. He said it would be cool if I shared it with uh, the audio portion with my radio uh, listeners. So I decided to edit that together and put together this show. And so that's who we're going to be talking to. And he really shares some great information, much better then uh, copycat Martin Willis's interview with the same guy that's also going to be airing because you got an interview also that you're going to be adding to your uh, your podcast this week. That's right. Yeah, we really need to talk a little. I know, isn't that funny? Prior. Yeah. yeah. Well, they reach out to the same people, and uh, you know, and that's the but way I it will, goes. Yeah, I will say this. You know, you and I. I mean, I your podcasts um, and you occasionally listen to mine and you know we both ask different questions I think we're we're both very conversational but I think um, I don't think that's going to take away from any of it because I think the listener will hear something different on both of our shows Absolutely. I agree with you yeah we have different like with MJ I know I, I went into uh, different aspects than you will um, which is right, exactly good. So people, and I always hear that feedback too, that people enjoy listening, even if we have the same people on to our different interviews because we look at things differently. Um, although, although we ask different questions, one thing I, I have been telling people at the beginning of the show is that Open Minds uh, UFO Radio covers credible UFO news and information. We do it in a journalistic style in that we are looking for credible information we're sharing with you, the public. We're trying not to do too much speculation, although if we speculate, we ne let you know that is speculation as opposed to jumping to assumptions like happens a lot in this field. We want to share with you the latest breaking um, news out there, and there's always a lot of great breaking news. First, though, on the last show, I ended talking about Stanton because just before I posted the show, I was able to share with you all that. Unfortunately, Stanton Friedman uh, had passed away. And uh, of course, that is a bit of news. Since I, I let you all in, talk to you all about that, um, Stanton, uh, this news has gotten all over the place. And uh, I've been on Coast to Coast. I've been on a bunch of podcasts talking about Stanton. And I feel like I've talked about him a lot. Uh, we've had, I've had so many interviews with him that you all can listen to, um, but I think I kind of shared my my heartfelt uh, um, 
feelings all over the place. But uh, Stanton's just a wonderful person. Uh, Martin and I talked about this on his show. But, uh, yeah, such sad news. Huh, yeah, Martin? we dedicated the whole 25 minutes, yeah. Yeah, so quite a bit. It was, it was really great. I've had so so much, so many people have uh, commented on the, that segment you and I did mm -hmm. together about Stanton. Yeah. Um, it, it's very heartwarming. And uh, it's it's really wonderful to know um, yeah, how much he was loved. I mean, there's so many people have commented on the uh, video I have up on YouTube where it was you and I talking about him. You, you know, there's so many people that just thought the world of him. It was great. Mm hmm. Right, exactly. So, uh, and Newsweek, right? Newsweek had an yeah. article even. Yeah, I have that right here in front of me. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, and, uh, and I think that's great. I mean, that they. You know, a magazine like that is going to, you know, basically honor him and, and write a really nice article about him. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this, there's a, some fun stuff about Stanton. So, I was with my friends. Uh, we went to Oregon uh, last weekend. And, of course, I went there not just to see what it was like, the McManamus McVinville UFO Fest, but also because there was an unprecedented situation that Jeremy Corbell, especially... But uh, George Knapp also had arranged where, first of all, it's great enough to be able to hear Jeremy and George, but also they brought Bob Lazar and David Fravor, which is so interesting because, you know, I'm a huge fan of, uh, of George Knapp. He's my mentor. I'm also a big fan of Jeremy. I actually like his, uh, I say actually because not everybody likes his, the artistic side of, of what Jeremy does, but I do. Um, I'm always a fan of his films, even the ones that aren't really about much. I think I, I like his style. But, yeah, to have Fravor, who is essentially per, the cr most credible witness in perhaps one of the most credible cases ever, at the end, mm -hmm. uh, George Knapp had said, because of the NY t New York Times article and Fravor's involvement, it has probably launched this case to the top case ever, in UFO history, and I think that is a very strong argument, personally. Um, so you have this guy, wow. and then you have Bob Lazar, who is probably, you know, one of the most controversial figures, uh, who is not, uh, doesn't fit that level of credibility, not to say that, you know, I'm not being judgy here, I'm just saying, you know, he's not a fighter pilot, in fact, you know, we can't even confirm his educational uh, background. But uh, it's so interesting, and it does remind me, you know, one of the reasons that I, I really, um, over the years, have been on the fence with Bob Lazar is because George Knapp speaks so strongly in, in um, supporting uh, Lazar's case, and I just feel that Lazar, or that uh, George Knapp is, has one of the best, um, you know, I guess, records for integrity and judgment that uh, it just would be, it's shocking to me. It's almost harder for me to believe that George could get something like this wrong. I mean, that is the hardest thing for me to believe more than anything, surprisingly, uh, even more than the possibility of aliens, especially these days. So, um, so it, it was just a really interesting dynamic, and I know some people were concerned of, of uh, you know, those people being on stage and, and people worried that Fravor's uh, credibility will get damaged over all of that. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I was... I, I know. I'm always... I don't, I don't care what happens. I'm always going to be on the fence about Bob Lazar, and, and I do get a lot of mail about that, and it's yeah. not friendly mail. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but, yeah. But that's okay. Uh, that's just my opinion. Yeah, I get it on both sides, you know. Uh, how can you give it any credibility at all or, or any consideration at all? And then the other side, which is, of course, it's true. How can you doubt it at all? So, um, yeah. you know, that's always how it goes. But much as, as much of a mystery as UFOs, really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So the whole thing was a lot of fun. But if people were following my Twitter, I was live tweeting as Fravor was making some great comments. And people were flipping out, uh, mainly because Fravor said some great things, essentially that, uh, you know, that there's no way, uh, this is the only question that I, and I had a bunch of questions, we had to write them on a, a 
piece of paper and then they would ask them. But it was a packed room. There were at least a few hundred people there. And uh, only one of my questions got through. And I didn't get a lot of time or flavor. I got a little. Ooh, I can share one exciting story. But um, so anyway... Uh, my question was, you know, is there any doubt in his mind that there's this what the tic tac that he uh, essentially engaged, or at least was kind of in a short cat and mouse with with his fighter jet? You know, does he think that there's any way that could be a missile or any other tech of ours? And he said, absolutely not. And here's the reasons. First of all, definitely not a missile. I mean, I asked that question, although uh, of course I know given his testimony, there's no way it could be a missile. In fact, uh, you know, one of our colleagues said, well, you do know that there was a missile test in that area about that period of time. Sure, but this was not a missile. And because I said, well, I don't put much into that, this person was like, oh, you obviously are so biased and jaded, blah, blah, blah. And um, um, that's not the case at all. What Fravor describes is very clearly something that was hovering that he essentially chased then at that point, closed in on, and then it moved, recognizing he was there before making a maneuver and then darting off at a very high speed. And missiles just don't do that. I just don't hmm. believe Fravor could mistake that for a missile, nor does he. Um, and then as of far course. as it being man-made, he says there's absolutely no way. The maneuverability I saw, he said it's definitely possible it could be ham man-made and a black project, but he doesn't think so because he does not believe, you know, we have propulsion uh, that is that advanced. And even if we did 15 years ago, even he said, this is, I think, a really important quote that he gave. By the way, this wasn't the controversial part, but uh, he said, even if 15 years, you know, at, at the beginning when this happened 15 years ago, I, I was more open to the idea that it could be one of our secret projects. But as time has gone on, he just feels there's absolutely no way they could keep technology like that hidden for so yeah. long. I'm so glad he said that. Mm hmm. Because um, that's that's something that comes up all the time. And, you know, there are some people, I mean, I had a skeptic on my show a number of years ago, a filmmaker that uh, basically said they were all, you know, black projects. And, and uh, you know, we, we got in a little bit of a debate about it. And I totally agree with that statement. I'm glad he said it. And not only that, you know, he, he follows it up saying that here, for instance, this jet plane, this plane... He knows from experience, he's, it's a very educated statement that he's making, and he's backing it up with examples of technology that was not able to remain hidden uh, despite best efforts. So, you know, he's backing it up with, with examples. So it's, he, it makes his argument to this point that much more stronger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But here's what he said that was controversial. You ready for it? I'm ready. People were getting really upset when I tweeted, like, flipping out. He's essentially saying that he's questioning, and he brought this up because he was prodded by Jeremy and George, who obviously were familiar with his feelings in this, this area and want, uh, wanted him to share them. He is very doubtful of most of the other testimony. Like, and it, it, Really? He, he indicates that some of the testimony he's extremely doubtful of. Oh, my God. And when That's I tweeted unreal. these things, I was very nice. Here's a comment he made I didn't <laughs> even tweet about that people are going to really flip out even more. Like I was saying, I was mild, actually, in my tweets. People were flipping out about. Um, he said, I actually chased this thing. I didn't experience any PTSD. I don't think anybody experienced PTSD. He said... There were only four witnesses that laid eyes on this thing, and they're all pilots. I'm one. My wingmate is one, who's going to be an, ident an unidentified a female, who's remained anonymous. And another witness who is in the New York Times, and one other. That is it. No one else saw the Tic Tacs. No one saw the Tic Tacs in binoculars. Um, so well, What about... What about the uh, what? What is it called? The hawk? I uh, can't remember what it's called. The Hawkeye. Um, I don't know. I can't remember exactly what it's called. But it's the uh, it was the plane, the radar Ewak. plane, and 
in the sky. Yeah, yeah. That, with a big, huge dish on it. Yeah. Um, supposedly, there are witnesses that said they saw it out the window briefly. He doubts and, that. Uh, he doubts that. Mm-hmm. Now, he thinks they're trying to step on a bandwagon? Of, of, exactly. He really? even went there. He said he thinks people are fabricating stuff or at least trying to get uh, involved in the excitement. And, wow. um, yeah, I know. Like and Rendlesham you, Forest, in a way. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Like Rendlesham Forest, Roswell, any number of cases. Whether or not that's happening, I don't know. That's his feeling. Um, he, he's, you know, he says there's no way people could have laid eyes on it with Binox. He said he doesn't even think the Princeton would have been able to get it on radar from where they were. So uh, a lot of interesting statements uh, that he made wow. to that effect. Now, people are flipping out. How could he say that? What a jerk, you know, all of this sort of thing. But here's the evidence he has. He's saying this is 15 years later. You have all wait, these wait, people. Wait, can you just back up a second here? Yeah. Run didn't the time. Princeton, didn't they uh, direct him to go out and meet the target? I don't know. Yeah, I mean that's at this point I don't know. At this point, he he didn't speak clearly on that, and hopefully I'll get an interview and I'll ask him more details. Not that it's even, but uh, he, it, he even talks about that in in interviews that there was a merge, a merge plot where they merged together on he, uh, radar. I know that, but you know, and that's a good point because I was thinking of that. But he didn't say the merge plot was captured by the Princeton. Um. Mm -hmm. That would be possibly captured by the radar uh, aircraft that was near them. Wow. That, I'm really that's bad. what directed them in. And that's where this merge plot comes from. Um, so I don't know. There's more details that have to be uh, figured out. But um, his point was this. When asked, well, how would you know any of that? He said, you know, I would have been told. First of all, when I got off, I saw the radar data. I saw the, the footage, the video footage, which was high eight. And so there people are like, wow. we want the HD. Where's the original yeah. HD? There was no original HD. Back then, uh, they were it was analog on high eight. So what we've seen has been digitized from an analog video. And the other mm -hmm. thing is is that he he after this event occurred, because he was the head guy, you know, that was a witness. Everybody gave him everything they had as far as what they knew had occurred, that he collected everything that they, he knew had occurred, reviewed it all over and over and over again, because he, you know, his brain is spinning. You could imagine, what the heck did we experience out there? He's trying to figure this all out. And so he says, I would have known back then when I, you know, talked to all my buddies, the captains and everybody on all the other ships, they would have told me if people would have seen it with binoculars. He makes this argument. He said something like, if one guy saw this thing with binoculars, the whole ship would have because they all would have been running over there to get a look. But that didn't happen. So that's why he's like, I don't think that anybody got any scopes on this or uh, binocs on this thing. So, um, yeah, those are his arguments that uh, and, and, and to a little bit to his credit, you know, um, just like with a police report, you gather all the facts immediately. Because as time mm -hmm. goes on, people forget the details. And, uh, and of course, a lot of the current, the newer witnesses coming forward, uh, they are trying to remember something that occurred 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. So that's another argument that, that he makes. So he's got some good arguments. I think what we have to focus on is not the negativity, not judging the witnesses, but looking at the facts, looking at the information posed by everyone, and in the end, what we want is not a bunch, an abundance of uh, anecdotal information. I mean, what did that do for Roswell? Roswell, we have an abundance of, you know, yeah. uh, anecdotal information ranging from not too wild to extremely wild. That does us no good. In fact, that almost hurts. What we need is the most credible stuff. So just like the SCU, they released their report on all of this. They focused on the pilot reports, the radar data, you know, the real credible stuff. That's what we need, and that's what we need to focus on. So we shouldn't get too distracted or waste too much energy, especially on being judgy or negative, but uh, just focus on the, the real credible information.
Well, you know, we ha- he, you have to take him seriously for many, many yeah. reasons. Yeah. First of all, he was definitely an eye- eyewitness to whatever it was. Um, secondly, it's not just anybody they're going to put behind the wheel of something like that. Right. That uh, $50 million machine. Um you know, highly skilled, highly intelligent, and and knows aviation inside and out. And so it's it, you really have to take the guy seriously. Um, but do. I'm totally baffled by the I people know. I have interviewed and talked I to know. before, and the information that's out there. I know. So now yeah. I feel like I need to talk to him. <laughs> I know. I hear you. Yeah. yeah, I know, because that you know everybody's kind of feeling like this, almost like the carpet's been taken out from under us but you know we have to learn from experience and uh, colonels you know these high-ranking military officers can all often be like this colonel halt's been like this very protective over the information with rendlesham and very quick to dispute any uh you know witness testimony that arises that he feels is inaccurate i mean um, you have probably experienced, I've experienced it whenever an alleged new witness comes forward, Halt is very quick to send an email saying, Hey, this guy sounds completely full of it. Here's where he's got mm-hmm. it wrong. Um, mm-hmm. so, you know, I think that they feel they're the authorities cause that's, that's their job typically, you know, Hey, I'm the ranking officer yeah. on top of this thing. So I'm supposed to have all the facts. Um, right. You know, that's what's expected of me. And, uh, so I think he does feel, at least it feels like some amount of ownership, but at least he wants to express that, hey, I've got some problems with some of what these people are saying. Yeah, I'm glad he does that. And yeah. yes, he is pr- protective. And, and, you know, after meeting him and talking with him several times, I just feel, you know, I don't have any doubts about what he says either. And the one, the one thing that's really great about um, Charles, or Chuck as he likes to be called, is that uh, there's absolutely no reason why he'd want to get behind something like that if he didn't have to. Right. Yep, exactly. You know? And, you know, if, if he could turn back the clock, he definitely would. He's if he actually could told turn me that. Turn back time. <laughs> time. I heard that song <laughs> recently. So there we go. So don't flip out too much, people. Uh, but uh, yeah. Jeremy is going to be releasing. He's super tired. He got back and then he went, uh, I don't know. Did something cool, I'm sure. And then uh, he, he says he's got to rest up for a little bit. But as soon as he can, he's going to be releasing the video so everybody can hear Fravor themselves. Oh, um, and uh, that's so, cool. Yeah. yeah. So we'll see this soon. And, uh, you know, I think that one of the aspects I didn't cover was uh, just kind of how odd it is almost to see, especially in the last panel, Lazar and, and Fravor sitting next to each other. But... Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can it, see. You know, mm-hmm. I was going to go to that. You know, I had an estate sale this last weekend, and I couldn't go. But I had planned to actually go to uh, Mc, the McMinnville where you were at. Mm-hmm. I'm really regretting I didn't rearrange some things. Yeah, I had no idea all those people were going to be there. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So other news. That was some news. That is some news. I'm not writing a story on that really at this point, but uh, I hope to interview. Fravor in the future and maybe share some other information. So you can see that on my Twitter or if you go to the Open Mind UFO News uh, Facebook group, somebody took all my Twitters and put them together into a post that is on, on there so you can read those there as well. But otherwise, the other big news is essentially the embargo is list- lifted on reviews for Unidentified. So all of us who have gotten to see the first episode, uh, including myself on Den of Geek, uh, and I've got that in the top headlines. And then Mm -hmm. Ryan Sprague wrote uh, a review on Unidentified also. Um, So you can check those out, but I like them. Uh, You got to see a preview, right? Yes, the screener. Mm -hmm. And I think we both said we both liked Unidentified. Like now we can release at least a little bit of information, such as that other witness, the female pilot who wants to remain anonymous. She is in the show. They do a great job covering the backgrounds of all the main guys like Steve Justice and Chris Mellon, uh, Tom DeLonge and Luis Elizondo. And then they get into the Nimitz thing, mostly driven by the testimony of this anonymous pilot. But also Fravers in there and others. Email phone, yep. Mm-hmm. And they do such a great job. I, I think it, it's a great show so far. 
Well, I'll tell you, I've, I've said it before. It's really the best thing I've watched on the subject on TV. Really. Yeah. It's really know, good. Karen I can't said wait that. to see the rest of the series. I agree. It's really good. You know what it almost reminds me of is uh, the UFO Files, which was a really good show in the past, mm. too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, mm -hmm. John Greenwald was one of the producers on that show, which I help, think helped make it a, a good show. But, uh, yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. That's really great, and I just can't wait. Uh, you know, I'm sure you talk about that in your interview and the different episodes, but I, I just can't wait for the next one to come out. Yeah. And uh, this is coming up this Friday. Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. It's the 31st. It's on uh, 31st, the 31st, and it's um, 10, 9 Central Time on the History Channel. Yeah. What's funny is there's going to be a lot of people watching Ancient Aliens who will stick around for it because it's going to be after Ancient Aliens. And I think they're going to be floored mm. by the credibility because it's not speculative like Ancient Aliens. Yeah. But those who try to tune in who are really into the credible stuff, um, who kind of uh, are uh, a little bit, uh, you know, not into Ancient Aliens, I'll put it that way, they're going to probably have some funny reactions i'm sure there's going to be a lot you know it's been a long time since i watched ancient aliens but i caught some of it before i was gonna watch unidentified and that ought to be interesting but otherwise the history channel also has released a couple of articles this week so we've heard if you've listened to Luis elizondo who used to run this pentagon program um and I should say, those who aren't aware that that's what Unidentified is focused on, is To the Stars, uh, which was founded by Tom DeLong, which is an organization that researches UFOs and also puts out entertainment on, on all of this. Uh, Chris Mellon, Steve Justice, and others are part of this organization. Uh, Luis Elizondo used to work for the Pentagon investigating UFOs, retired, uh, and that was just one of the things that he did in there, but he retired and joined to the stars so the show is focused on to the stars but really it's luis elizondo's the lead guy and of course he's important because he also did these government investigations so uh it's just a really good show and the history channel has put out a couple of articles one's called these five ufo traits seen by navy fighters defy explanation and these are five traits that elizondo says is important when identifying uh, uh, what when examining UFO cases. And so he's talked about these traits before. And the other one is when Top Gun pilots tangled with a baffling tick tape shoot shaped UFO, which of course is some detail about this Nimitz case that we've been talking about that Fravor's part of. What you cut yeah. off for a second. Um, so okay. but you're going to um, read us the five traits. Yes, but if okay. I'm cutting out, uh, well, why don't you go, you have that in front of you? Uh, no, go ahead. Okay. Uh, one is anti-gravity lift. Uh, two is sudden and instantaneous acceleration. Three is hypersonic velocities without signatures. Four is low observability or cloaking. And five is transmedium travel. And all that has uh, thorough uh, paragraphs of uh, a description of what they mean. And what's cool is Lou likes to highlight that he's looking for uh, anything that has any one of those traits, because those are things that we can't do or, or that are difficult for us that we can learn. Uh, if we can learn from the technology how to do any of those better, it's a big deal. But what's shocking is most of these cases, like at Nimitz, it exhibited all five of those traits. Yeah, that's for sure. Yep. So cool wow. stuff. All right. Well, yeah. thanks for joining me for the news. Our news is about as long as our interview this week, but I uh, figured we, you know, I wanted to give the listener something um, for this week and uh, also get uh, you all this great information from Anthony Lapp. So we'll take a break and we'll come back with, uh, you know, Anthony Lapp, the executive producer for Unidentified. And uh, thank you so much for joining us, Martin. My pleasure as always. All right, this podcast is actually going straight to podcast. We're not on a radio, so we don't need any breaks. So let's go ahead and get into our interview with Anthony Lapp. We did this interview very early in the morning, and both of us kind of funny, funnily are using our, our morning voices. Um, also, it was done on the phone, so it uh, the audio is not that great, but you'll see 
why I wanted to get this audio to you because it's a lot of fun and gives you a lot of insight on this great show. So I hope you enjoy this interview. Let's go ahead and talk to Andrew. Uh, The first thing he did was ask me if I had seen an episode yet, and I told him, yep, I've seen the first episode. First episode. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. So you get the idea of, I mean, that was, it's it's really somewhat of a chronological almost year in the life of uh, Lou Elizondo, Chris Mellon, and the rest of the guys. We started following them last spring, and um, we kind of see what happens to to them. We get to know them. We get, learn a lot more about several different incidents. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean that's that's kind of the scope of the the show. Um, mm-hmm. And I guess for you, uh, how did this begin? How did you find out about it, and how did uh, yeah. this all come about? Um, I'm a filmmaker and, a, and, a, and a, an investigative journalist uh, who's been really interested in looking at stories that, you know, kind of uncovered. So I did a, a huge series for the History Channel, an eight-hour kind of epic look at the history of the war on drugs, for instance, um, about two years ago, that um, really dug deep into the CIA's involvement in the drug trade and had many sources from actually from the DEA making allegations about the CIA. Uh, So I've done a lot of stuff around uh, intelligence um, work um, a lot. I've spent some time, a lot of time in the Middle East, uh, so I've been a, a lot around the U.S. military and other militaries. Um, so that's kind of my background. I, I used to run a website called the Guerrilla News Network, which is kind of an alternate news website. Mm-hmm. It started in 2000. You might have heard of it. Um, yeah. So I've done lots of different things. I used to run, you know, ran a website, uh, <clears throat> which I think it had a lot of crossover to what you guys are doing at Open Minds. Um, so I'm kind of, uh, but this was interestingly enough a topic that I really did. Actually, at GNN we covered the, a lot the early when the Disclosure Project started and they had their first com- press conferences and all those guys came out. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I definitely covered that. And and it's a subject that I've always been really interested in personally, but really didn't and never dug deep into, never did any work around. Um, and then I was at um, A&E Originals, which is in a, a, a division of history of A&E Networks that produces, it's like an internal studio, essentially. And I, I did a film about Bobby Kennedy last year. And um, and then they came to the, the people who run A&E Originals had been talking with Lou and Chris and Tom about doing something with them. And they had signed them up and, and got kind of exclusive access to them and said, hey, meet these guys. And I, I met... Um, Steve, and I met uh, Chris and Lou first, and it was just like, holy shit, <laughs> this is like the biggest story in the universe. What was your reaction um, to hearing you know, this intelligence officer was running a program at the Pentagon? Uh, honestly, my first impression was skepticism. Uh, having, n- I know a lot about uh, how the intelligence agencies work. I know about the history. You know, I've studied things like and reported on things like MK Ultra, um, Project Paperclip, um, the CIA's involvement in all sorts of nefarious coups and operations, and in what what actually what counterintelligence is. Um, so I was extremely skeptical and asked a lot of uh, the questions that I think a lot of people ask, which, uh, you know, when they're co- confronted with this information, which is, well, isn't this just some sort of advanced aircraft that we just don't know about yet? Um, and that was my first question. Um, and they begin, that began a dialogue with these guys and that began them, you know, very patiently sort of breaking down why they believe it's not. Um, and uh, it was really a process, and I think for me um, to to try to understand or try to get my head around really what was going on, but always from a skeptical point of view, I think what we try to do in this show is, and you see a little bit of it in episode one, but as we go through each of the episodes and more information comes out, we're meeting with more pilots and radar operators and other people, other witnesses, were constantly asking, you know, the counter factual question, you know, can this be explained by this or can this be explained by that? Um, so we really tried to take a um, 
an independent look at it and, and try mm-hmm. to let people make up their own minds and really hear these. I mean, the the real fascinating part about this story is, it, in part, Lou and Chris Mellon essentially are, are vessels uh, for the testimony of these military personnel. Um, and that's what's so fascinating about making what was a challenge as a filmmaker and was so interesting about their stories. These guys still have security clearances. They um, are still very connected with um, what's going on inside the Pentagon and what's going on on Capitol Hill. Um, so these they're not whistleblowers. They're, they mm-hmm. still are, are very uh, cognizant, both out of loyalty and commitment to the national uh, to the government, but also, um, you know, just in terms of their own legal situation. You know, mm-hmm. they're very, you know, try very hard not to disclose any classified information. Mm-hmm. Maybe you could talk to uh, the the level of credibility. Um, I mean, their backgrounds are so impressive. Uh, was that surprising to you that people, you know, with these sort of backgrounds would, first of all, be doing this sort of work, second of all, doing it publicly? Yeah, I mean, that was the first thing that attracted me to this project was who these guys were, what their backgrounds were, in particular, um, Chris Mellon's background um, as a high-ranking um, deputy assistant uh, Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and his role on the Senate Intelligence Committee. He had visibility over, you know, the special access programs that, you know, even top generals didn't have access to see. Um, mm-hmm. So this was a guy, as as Lou says, who knew all the secrets and who was, who was famous, you know, internally um, as someone who also was very much uh, into going to sites, going to places like Area 51 and Groom Lake, and going to other uh, black sites, um, and doing, you know, meeting with the people who are running these programs. So he was a very hands-on guy. Um, you know, he's he's really his. In in uh, frankly, just like with Lou Elizondo, you know, much of what he did was highly classified. So, you know. There's their lives are definitely still shrouded in mystery in terms of w- what exactly they were doing and where where they were deployed. All that stuff is still you know these guys were guys who worked in the shadows. Uh, for, so for them to come out, especially someone like Chris Mellon who has this family legacy as we all know, um, and to be speaking so candidly uh, and putting his reputation um, both in sort of, you know, his, his social circles and his political circles and his, his family legacy circles. It, it's a pretty big, big deal. Mm-hmm. Chris has been, you know, interested in this phenomenon for at least a few years. We know there's been some articles. Lou has been out and talking about uh, this, his work for a while, too. And they both feel that there's a genuine mystery. So as an investigative reporter going through this and, and like you said, trying to figure out, you know, do these things fit? Could it be something prosaic? Do you, uh, have you come to a similar conclusion to Chris and Lou that, you know, there is a genuine mystery? Yeah, I, I have. And uh, it's definitely was a process to, to get there. But as I, as, as, Chris calls it run all the traps and as I've talked to other experts um, as I've talked to there's there's many more pilots for instance that I've talked to personally off the record than you see in the show that I was able to talk to who weren't comfortable coming on the air who confirmed um, things about uh, some of the other incidents that we look into uh, that um, yeah, you know, I generally believe that there, the, that the U.S. Navy does not know what these things are, um, and that's what's so interesting about this this new April 2019 announcement of the new guidelines mm-hmm. that the, and the policies that they're putting in place for reporting unidentified craft is that in in you know, if you don't have to read between the lines to say that there, that is a tacit admission that this is not something that they, it's not our own craft. Mm-hmm. So you're really only left with two possibilities. 
um, which is it's a adversary, or, or I guess it could be an, an ally, but that would be fairly strange. But you're left with it could be some sort of terrestrial adversary. And, the, and that that's almost, you know, for these guys, that's almost even a scarier concept if, if, if Russia, for instance, has the capability to fly hypersonic uh, craft in and around our carrier strike groups. Um, that's just a very scary prospect. I mean, as experts said, they could zip a nuke and drop it in the White House and disappear before, you know, they even, like, open up the anti-ballistic guns on the top, you know, from the lawn there. Yeah. So it's... Uh, and and then and then and then that's where Steve Justice from Skunk Works comes in. You know, we've had I've had long both on the record conversations with him and off the record conversations with him about technology and about the evolution of technology and the evol- where we are today with uh propulsion systems, you know, things like the scramjet and other, you know, um hypersonic uh jets that, that are being developed. And even though there, we are on the edge today of, you know, a new realm of hypersonic craft, all those craft are still using conventional or somewhat conventional propulsion systems. They're not, you know, they'll have huge heat signatures, for instance, coming off of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so for, 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 for Steve Justice, it's, it just doesn't add up that, that, that's, even an adversary working in secret could could leapfrog uh, us to that degree um, mm-hmm. and have something that can can do the things that these things that these pilots are, are saying that they're seeing. And it's not only the pilots; it's you know, it's also we speak with radar operators um, as well. So I, it is a general. It's a it's it, it is a genuine mystery. I think a big. A big uh, one of the people that was extremely helpful um, in our investigation and who plays a big role in our in the show, as you, as you see, is Brian Bender, national security correspondent for Politico, mm-hmm. who um, both you know doesn't give it get a lot of credit because but his story ran the same day as the New York Times story did back in 2017. He was reporting the same story and and really had dug deep into it spent a lot of time personally with Elizondo and Mellon and and he just has incredible contacts inside the Pentagon, inside the intelligence community, um, inside the technology community and weapons contractors and he and I um have become friends and, and, and he's been, you know, extremely helpful for me because he's someone who's just at a whole other level in terms of understanding what's going on inside the Pentagon and time and the intelligence agencies and he's you know he independently, you know, has come to the same conclusion that he believes that the the Pentagon clearly does not know what's going on um, with these craft. That there is a growing sense inside the Pentagon that it's something that needs to be studied more, and that's really the um, the story that we show. It's, it, the series has a pretty incredible arc to it. As I said, it really is like a linear. Um, year in the life of these guys. And, you know, it begins, you know, sort of shortly after the New York Times article comes out and it, and it ends. And we were, what was really incredible about the April 2019 uh, Navy uh, announcement that they, they were uh, going to be establishing new policies and guidelines for reporting UAP and they're going to be, you know, analyzing the data is that. Um, we we kind of have a front row seat to how that policy um, was established. Um, mm-hmm. I can't really say what we see had a direct result because we don't really know about the sort of cause and effect. But uh, as you'll see in the series, we um, both Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo are closely involved um, with what's going on inside the Pentagon. Over the course of this last year, and, and these, and they consider that Navy announcement to be a huge victory for sort of everything that they've been doing behind the scenes, and we're able to chronicle that. Oh, that's amazing! Can I ask one more question? Do I have time? Sure. Great. So uh, the question would be kind of like what you were talking about, um, cause and effect. 
So to the stars, it turns out, you know, we know this through Chris and through Lou, and even Tom has talked about this, how they had an influence, and he said, we're going to see this in the show, which is exciting, on the Navy uh, coming up with new UFO guidelines. What impact do you hope this show has on uh, the public? That's a great question. Um, we really framed this show as something that is going to, what we hope is going to be super accessible to everyone, to people like your listeners who are deeply you know, invested both emotionally and intellectually in this story. Uh, but we also made a show um, that anyone who has sort of just been reading the headlines and seeing this, you know, um, in the news and seeing, you know, I think a lot of people when I talk to about this topic, they say, it seems like there's more and more headlines about UFOs all the time. What's going on? Is that just my imagination? Uh, so we really made it, you know, for that viewer. Um, and that was, that's what's so great, I think, about Lou Elizondo is he's such an accessible guy. I think part of what you'll, you get to see over the course of the series is really, you really get to know him as a person and, and some of the challenges and the risks he's taken by coming out publicly about this. I mean, this was a, this was a project, you know, a, a portfolio that he never asked for. He was working in all sorts of other counterintelligence, you know, operations, a lot of them related to the war on terror. You know, he was in Afghanistan shortly after 9-11. I mean, this is, this is a guy who was on the front lines of a lot of some of the most important uh, operations of our national security apparatus and he was kind of just handed this this portfolio so uh he's you know we really try to allow people uh, show him as as uh who he is and allow people to get to know him um so but to your larger question which i think is a great question what i hope i hope that people will watch this and and become you know uh intrigued and and will open their minds and say okay these because you know the strength of our what we're able to show here is these military pilots are really some of the most credible people um you could ever meet and this is not to discount you know everyday civilians who who capture things you know in their backyard or wherever um but military pilots are a special breed these people are trained to observe. They know they've spent hours and hours and hours in the skies. They know what belongs there. They know what doesn't belong there. They know what our enemy aircraft look like. They know what our um, our own aircraft look like, and they know what capabilities things have in the air. So when they're seeing things, especially in the incidents that we're looking at, are all in broad daylight, right? And they're seeing these things that are corroborated when they get back to the ship by their radar operators. That there are things, and you know, they're quantifying how these things are flying, and the speeds and the elevations and all the weird things that they're doing. Uh, and then you take into account that these pi what these pilots have to lose. You know, when you're an F-18 pilot, fighter pilot, you really are at the top of your game. You're you're someone when you go into the military to become an F-18 pilot is really to you've reached the pinnacle. You know, just to become a pilot in the Navy, right, is a is a dream for thousands of people that that never gets uh, fulfilled. But to be a Top Gun. Or, or an F-18 pilot is just, a, you, know, you are absolutely at the top of your game, and you could be grounded for, for very small infractions, can get you grounded, and you could your wings clipped. So for these guys to come forward, and, and women, sorry, um, to, and to say things about what's, what they see in the air, and to call and to, and to talk about how, you know, they're, they're feeling like, um, that the Navy isn't really studying it and that they're feeling, you know, that there's a danger that's not being addressed is pretty dramatic. Um, and that's what you and you see um, in this series, is you're going to see people who have everything to lose. They've worked their whole lives, uh, you know, to reach where they are, and they're coming forward saying that, uh, you know, they feel like there's a potential threat here that needs to be addressed. That's awesome. Yeah, no, I hope we, I hope we, I hope we, uh, you know, we deliver something that uh, pushes the needle forward for everyone involved here. Because you know, I just wanted to say, you know, I've come out of this with just a huge 
newfound respect for the people like yourself who have been sort of working in your own way in the shadows uh, on this issue because um, it's a, it's a difficult issue. I mean, it's it's I'm I have a nervous energy right now in, in of, of just thinking about this thing going on in the air and you know my journalistic reputation and it, it's a it's a tricky tricky thing to be associated with for a lot of people and um, when you when you work in, in journalism like I do, you know, it's, um, uh, it's a, it's, it, it can be a little daunting to, to be associated with this issue, to be frank. And I think, uh, you know, that's true for a lot of people. And that's true for a lot of these pilots, as you, as you'll see over the course of the series, you know, this is not something that they really are like excited to be associated with. Mm-hmm. Um, and it took, you know, a lot of, t- took some of these pilots did not want to talk and we took a lot to get them on the air, uh, you know, in front of the camera. And it also took, you know, for, as I said, I've talked to many more that you don't see who spoke on background and confirmed a lot of the accounts but but didn't really want don't didn't want to be associated with it and didn't so but I think that's changing I mean I think these new policies it's just a, it's just an incredible change um, and, and, and as I said an admission that there's something that they they really don't understand so um, I think we're on we you know we are definitely as Lou says in the show we're on a precipice here there's definitely a change and there's a change that's going on inside Washington right now at the highest levels of power um, that you will see um, happen before your eyes in the, over the course of the six episodes of Unidentified um, you will see these guys and what's going uh, um, working behind the scenes to to change both policy but also just to, to open people's minds um, about what's going on. So they're all very excited about the series um, and the, the initial reaction that we're getting is, you know, that a lot of people are excited about it. So I'm just, you know, I just feel very lucky to, as a journalist to have kind of stumbled into this story and, and stumbled into meeting these guys and having a, the incredible access that we've had. They were incredibly generous with their access. As you'll see, I mean, we, are, we rolled hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours of tape with these guys we're traveling all over both the country and the world. There's really a fascinating story, um, which I can't tell you about too much right now, but um, they actually travel to a European country and meet with some military active duty Mm. military people from a NATO country um, who want to share information with them. So this is not just uh, an American story, it's a global story, as you know. And that's what makes it so fascinating. At the end of the day, you know, these things are being seen all over the world, and they have been Mm -hmm. seen over the world at least for 70 years so to explain them by some simple black budget secret program is is very difficult thank you so much to andrew lapp i am so excited for the show i hope you all are too like you heard martin and i saying and others you know it's a great show i think you're all gonna love it of course i'm mr happy happy joy joy and i always say these shows are pretty good Um, But really, this one's great. I mean, it's unprecedented. If you've read my review, uh, I stick by everything I said there. And if you haven't, go to Den of Geek uh, and check that out. You can also, of course, look at the links that we provide on the front page of OpenMinds.tv. You'll find all the news stories that we refer to on OpenMinds.tv. Also, be sure to check UFOCongress.com. Of course, the conference is coming up, and there are new speakers listed there on a regular basis. Also, I think there might be one UFO lamp available. We'll be getting more. But uh, if you want one really soon, you know, with that hovering UFO, you can get one more. But check out the store for other really cool stuff. Um, Let's see what else. Otherwise, I guess just my thank yous. Thank you to Systematics for the bumper music. Thank you to Caleb Hanks for the awesome opening and close music. And, of course, thank you to Martin of UFO Podcast for joining me with the news. And finally, as always, thank you, the listeners, so much for being here. And my Patreon patrons, remember, if you want exclusive information, then uh, go join my Patreon. And it's as low as like a buck a month and you get exclusive info. I'll have some more up soon. And I'll be giving away a t-shirt this week and starting a new t-shirt giving giveaway next week. So until next time, adios muchachos. 